Um, did you want to say anything, or are you happy for me to? Uh, I think it would be nice if I could uh, okay. uh, make some okay. introduction. Uh, I suppose the presentation is going to be in English. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I have my introduction would be. That's uh, fine, yeah. Important. Uh, hoje nós temos o privilégio de ter aqui o professor Ben Evans, que vai fazer uma apresentação não apenas sobre o programa de engenharia da Francis. University, mas também sobre um projeto, que é um projeto extremamente ambicioso, de carros em alta velocidade. É, professor Ben, por favor. Ok, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming, thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat to you today. Uh, I don't know how long I've got um, to talk. Oh, okay, I probably won't speak for that long. So I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and talk for about maybe 45 minutes and then I'll leave lots of time at the end, at the end for questions and answers. Um, I don't speak Portuguese, I apologize. Is everybody okay in understanding me if I speak in English? Yes, I will try my best to speak nice and clearly. Um, if there's anything that you don't understand, if you think I said something interesting but you didn't understand what I said, just put your hand up and we can ask somebody to do a translation. And certainly when we get if we have questions and answers at the end, if you want to ask your question in Portuguese, we can find a translation for you. Okay. Um, just out of interest, how many of you have heard about this project before, the Bloodhound Supersonic Car Project? One. Where did you hear about this? Discovery On the Discovery Channel. Excellent. Um, this, I'm a little bit biased, okay? Um, I've been working on this project for about five years now, um, so I'm biased. But I think this is one of the most exciting engineering projects anywhere on the planet, certainly anywhere in the UK. Um, what we're trying to do at a, at a very simple level is design the fastest car in the world. Um, we're trying to design a car that will have a top speed of 1,000 miles per hour. And the, the reason we're doing this, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons why we're doing this. Um, one reason is I think it's important that engineers and scientists tackle problems simply because they are difficult. Okay? I think when engineers and scientists put their minds together to solve difficult problems, we have interesting results. Um, the second reason we're doing it, this is because Britain wants to pr continue promoting itself as one of the lead players in engineering. Uh, so we're using this as a British project that we can promote British engineering around, around the world, um, which is lovely for me because it means I get to travel a lot and I spend quite a bit of my time traveling around talking about this project. And hopefully, in a couple of years' time, when we have the fastest car in the world, um, you will all remember that uh, Britain was at the heart of this. So that's, that's kind of the, the motivation for doing this. And I guess that answers the question, why? Okay? Um, there's, there's also a big education program that runs in the UK along with the Bloodhound Project. So there are uh, school children all across the United Kingdom learning about science, maths, technology, engineering, and using this as the kind of case study to get them hooked um, and get them interested. But what I'm going to focus on today is how we're doing this. Uh, my background is in aerospace engineering. I studied aerospace engineering, did uh, a PhD at Swansea University in the UK, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end. Um, but in my talk, I'm going to focus on this particular project um, in computational fluid dynamics, CFD. Um, I work in a department that has that very strong uh, research strength in numerical modeling, um, computer simulation. Um, and that's what I apply to this. I've been working on this now for about five years. Two years ago, I became a lecturer in aerospace engineering. Um, so I'm going to look at a few of these questions here. What is the significance about taking a vehicle faster than the speed of sound? That's the first thing we're going to look at. Um, then I'm going to do a very quick introduction to what CFD is, because not everybody I talk to has, has heard of CFD or has any familiar, familiarity with it. And what I'm going to try and do here is wrap up one of our master's courses, which takes an entire term. Um, and I'm going to condense it into about five minutes, so that will be interesting. Um, and then we're going to look at why, why the car is shaped the way it is. Um, oh, yes. Good, good button to press. Um, <laughs> for someone from the UK, I know this is your cool season, but from the UK, this still is warm for me. I, I got here, I'm like, goodness it's me, it's, hu it's humid, and, it's <laughs> and I've been struggling. Everybody's telling me, no, 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 this is very cool for Brazil. <laughs> Um, so we're going to look at then why the car is shaped the way it is, why, why aerodynamically does it need to be this shape, 
Um, and we're going to finish by looking at what might it be like to drive a car like this, because we've decided who is going to drive this. So I'm sorry if you came here hoping that you might be able to put in an application to be the driver. That, that position is taken. Um, and then we're going to have a little look towards the future. Um, before I start talking about this project, which is all about the future, it's all about um, engineers thinking about the big problems that face us in the 21st century and how we solve those problems, I just want to look a little bit back into history. Um, this vehicle here is arguably the first vehicle that nowadays we might look back on and refer to as a car. In 1769, uh, the word car in the English language hadn't been invented yet. Um, so this is a steam locomotive, um, and I would argue this is the world's first car. Does anybody want to have a guess at what the top speed of the world's first car was? Five miles an hour. Five miles an hour. Now, you're an engineer, which means you're intrinsically optimistic, and that's come across there. <laughs> In fact, it's two miles per hour. Okay, so a slow walking pace was the top speed of the world's first car. Anybody have any ideas what this car might have been used for? Cargo, it's for, it's for carrying heavy cargo. A lot, of, a lot of the time this was used for carrying heavy weaponry to battlefields. Okay, this is what it was used for. Um, just out of interest, are we engineers here? Predominantly engineers? Engineers and scientists. Um, one of the questions that engineers should always be asking when they look at the design of anything is, what are the, what are the problems with this? How, how could we, if we were to create the next generation of this thing, how could we improve it? That's what engineering design is all about. Can you see any fundamental engineering design problems with the design of the world's first car? Too heavy? Too? Yeah, okay, so three wheels. Center of gravity is obviously a long way forward, okay, which is problematic from a stability point of view. Um, have a think about, there's the driver on the top here. This is a steam locomotive, so it has a, a big boiler with a lot of steam going up. So what happens if you're the driver of this car? You're in danger. You're in danger. You get a face, you get a face full of steam. Okay? So there are a lot of problems with the world's first car. There was a, a, a little movie I'm going to show you now which demonstrates this. It was a nice experience driving this car. Okay? And of course, what has happened since which is the thing that happens in engineering design, is we identify the problems, we look for solutions, and we improve, and the next generation of cars was significantly better. And cars have got better and better over the 200, 250 or so years since the world's first car. If I fast forward 100 years in history, uh, we meet this gentleman here. This is a Frenchman whose name is Gaston de chasseloup Lobat. Um, he's driving an electric-powered car. Um, this car is, in fact, the very first car that was a land speed record car, specifically designed to achieve the fastest a car could go at. Um, one of the things I've learned about, have you, have you heard of the Guinness Book of Records? So the Guinness Book of Records is this famous book that lots of the world records throughout history have been saved in. Um, in the UK, it's a very popular thing to get people for Christmas presents. So people will buy a Guinness Book of Records as a Christmas present. And it's full of all kinds of weird and wonderful records. And lots of kids want to get their name one day to the Guinness Book of Records. That's their ambition. Okay? Uh, and I've realized there are, two, there are two ways of doing this. There's the easy way, and there's the hard way. The easy way, or the, let's start with the hard way. The hard way, which is what we're doing, is to go to the Guinness Book of Records, find a record that already exists, like the World Land Speed Record, or, um, I don't know, the highest stack of playing cards. There are all kinds of weird things in there. Find out what the current record is, and become the best in the world at that. That's the difficult way, okay? The easy way is just to create a new record yourself, just to create a new category for something. That's what Gaston did. He created this thing that he called the World Land Speed Record. Um, so, of course, whatever speed he managed to get in this, he created the record in the first place. So he was going to get his name into the book. Um, does anybody want to have a guess? This is 100 years on from the world's first car. What do you think the top speed of this, of Gaston's electric-powered vehicle was? 50 miles an hour, engineering optimism is kicking in once again. Anybody else want to have a guess? 20 miles an hour, now you're pessimistic. Okay. Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 39 miles per hour. Okay. Um, which I think is incredibly impressive that at the end of the 19th century, there was already an electric-powered car traveling at 39 miles per hour on the streets of France. 
And today, of course, we are considering engineers are spending a lot of time and energy and frustration trying to figure out how we practically solve the problem of moving towards sustainable vehicles for everyday use. And we haven't really got a practical alternative yet to traditional diesel and petrol engines. Of course, they do exist, and I think eventually we're going to move in this direction. But over 100 years ago, we already had a 39 mile per hour electric car. And it makes you wonder if the history of science and engineering had taken a slightly different route, and we put more investment into the, this kind of technology 100 years ago, what, what, you know, what technology and cars would look like today. Of course, uh, nowadays we're all driving around in cars that travel significantly faster than Gaston's electric powered car. Um, in terms of the land speed record, things started getting really interesting in the 1950s and 1960s. Because this was the point at the time where the land speed record had approached kind of 400, 500 miles an hour. And the people going for these records quickly realized that with traditional wheel driven cars, they pretty much reached the limit of what was going to be possible. So they decided, well, what we're going to do now is start putting jet engines into cars. And things get really exciting. Um, although, two of my mo most favorite cars from, from the history of the land speed record, and if you've got a Guinness Book of Records, it's worth having a look at some of these cars, because some of them are fascinating. Um, these two cars here um, both broke the land speed record in, in the 1920s, with speeds approaching 200 miles an hour. Um, they broke the land speed record on a beach, which is just down the road from where we live in Wales, in South Wales, in Swansea. Um, so, for that reason, there's a museum very near to where I live where you can go and see restored versions of these cars, and they're beautiful. But things got really interesting in the kind of 1950s, 1960s, where we started putting jet engines into cars. Um, this car here, Thrust 2, um, broke the land speed record in the early 1980s um, and got up to a speed of 633 miles per hour. And this, oh, thank you, Christina. Um, uh, and this car here, Thrust SSC, is the car that currently holds the land speed record. This is currently the world's fastest car, with a top speed of 763 miles per hour. That's for me. Oh, you've got me a really strong espresso. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this was not only the world's fastest car. Um, it set the record in 1997. It was also officially the first car to ever go faster than the speed of sound. It was the first supersonic car. Um, and what I'm going to talk about next is what the significance of that is. But hopefully, what you can see from this as well is how ambitious we are being with setting ourselves a 1,000 mile per hour target for Bloodhound. Um, in fact, if we manage to get Bloodhound 1,000 miles per hour, this will be the biggest percentage leap in the land speed record in the history of the world land speed record. Um, there have been times where I felt like we're being too ambitious here. There's obviously one of the dangers of a, of a project like this, which is incredibly high profile now. We've got coverage all over the world, as you said, on the Discovery Channel. They're doing documentaries on us. Um, and of course, the danger for us, from a PR point of view, is that in a couple of years' time, we manage to take blood down to 950 miles per hour, which will be a phenomenal success from an engineering point of view, from a kind of advancement of the world land speed record point of view. But we'll be deemed a failure because we have presented ourselves as the 1,000 mile per hour car. Um, I think that's what makes it exciting. The, the uh, video you had yeah. gave me the impression that you, you had a crash or something. Was, was that like a simulation? Oh, that was a simulation, yeah. I can show that again. Yes, so, so at the end, I'll talk about where we're at at the moment, what the time scale for the project looks like. Um, so we're being ambitious. There's no doubt about that. We're pushing deep into the supersonic regime of aerodynamics. And there are a lot of unanswered questions once we, once we push this far. Um, so I just want to spend a few moments thinking about what the specific challenges are of taking a vehicle to these kind of speeds. These are the kind of speeds we don't typically have to worry about in everyday life. Um, Dr. Holness, James and I traveled here, I've lost, completely lost track of time, I think it was last night or the night before last, um, overnight, um, in a Boeing 747, which is a fast aircraft, but it's still a subsonic aircraft. Okay? Um, we drove here today in a car from Sao Paulo through the traffic. Um, there were moments of the journey where I wish we had had Bloodhound. Um, but that was definitely a subsonic car. When we cycle around, when we walk around, we're traveling slower than the speed of sound. And what's happening whenever we travel slower than the speed of sound is that as we, as we uh, push air ahead of us, we, we disturb the air that's ahead of us, which causes pressure waves to be set up. Those pressure waves, or sound waves, propagate forwards. And essentially, the job they do for us is they tell the air ahead of us that we're coming. Okay? So right now, as I walk across the lecture theater, I'm, I'm propagating sound waves forward that tell the air ahead of me that I'm coming. They need to, they've, they've got this information that they need to start moving out of the way 
and everybody's happy, okay? I'm, I'm traveling down the motorway in my car. The air ahead of me knows that I'm coming before I arrive. It can start moving out of the way. It slides down the side of the car, fills in the space behind the car. The air is happy, the car's happy, I'm happy in the car. It's a wonderful world, okay? We have a problem, of course, when we accelerate to the same speed at which we can propagate that information forwards, okay? Um, once we get to the point where we're also traveling at the speed of sound, or faster than the speed of sound, we simply cannot tell the air ahead of us that we're coming. If, if, if I were to travel on Concorde, or had traveled on Concorde, um, that traveled at about two and a half times the speed of sound. It was impossible for a supersonic aircraft, and it is in the case of fighter jets today, for it to tell the air ahead of it that it's coming. So instead of everything happening nice and smoothly, which is what happens in the world of subsonic aerodynamics, we set up these strange phenomena. And what am I talking about? What do we get in supersonic aerodynamics? Shockwaves. Shockwaves, okay. And all a shockwave is, is a sudden discontinuity in the properties of the air. It's a sudden pressurization of the air. Rather than the pressure changes happening smoothly, they happen at a discontinuity. And that discontinuity is a shockwave which creates a sound as that shockwave passes across the ground. It creates a sonic boom. Um, in fact, when I was a, a little boy, I, I grew up on the south coast of Wales, uh, very close to Swansea, uh, where I now work. Um, and at the same time, every evening, I used to go for a little walk around the cliffs with my father um, as a little boy. And at the same time, every evening, it was about 25 past seven, every evening, there would be a loud bang above my head. It's almost like a clap of thunder, but, but a kind of like a sharper sound. And that was Concord. That was the Heathrow to New York flight. They used to take off, and I remember the adverts on television. I'm really sad, in a kind of romantic way, that this doesn't, we don't have the opportunity to travel on Concord anymore. But you could take off from London Heathrow, and there are adverts on television that told you this. You could take off from London Heathrow, fly to New York, and land in New York before you left London. Because the time difference between London and New York was bigger than the time it took to travel between the two. Which I just think, from a romantic point of view, is a lovely idea. You can do a day's work in London, jump on Concord, fly to New York take a lady out for dinner in New York. It's beautiful. Um, and of course, we don't have this opportunity anymore. Um, uh, it came to Brazil as well. The comp did, did yeah. it? And it came to Rio ah. and Campinas. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so you could have, did you ever? Could, uh, yeah. Did you fly on it? No. Never. No. Do you know what? I've given this talk. And this is why Concord failed, I think. Because I've given this talk all over the world to thousands of people. And not once when I've asked, has anybody flown on Concord? Did, has anybody put their hand? which I think is one of the problems that Concorde had. <laughs> um, so, how do we deal with this? Now, of course, when you think about aircraft and shockwaves, you've got these complexities that the designers of Concorde had to deal with, the designers of military aircraft today have to deal with, but they've got the luxury that aircraft are a long, long way from the ground when they generate these things. So the shockwaves typically will, will just fan out into space because of the viscosity of the air, the shockwaves will dissipate and lose their strength, and by the time they've reached the ground, they're not strong at all. Okay? They, there's this space around the vehicle for these shockwaves to dissipate. We've got a real problem with a supersonic car in that it's running across the ground. So those shockwaves will be generated as the, the nose reaches the air, and when there are different changes in the shape of the car, shockwaves will be generated. And they can't just dissipate out of space because there's the ground that the car is rolling across, which the shockwaves will interact with. Um, so one of the things that's been a real challenge for us in terms of modeling is how do we try and understand how these shockwaves are going to interact with the ground surface that the car itself is rolling across. Now, traditionally, aerodynamic design work has been done in what you see on the left-hand side here. Um, in fact, the aerospace industry still use these. Um, Formula One uh, companies uh, all have these, or nearly all of them have these. But certainly the aerospace industry and, and Formula One are, are shifting in the direction this technology known as CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Um, and essentially what we're doing in the world of CFD, and this is what I'm going to talk about for the next five or ten minutes or so, um, is virtual wind tunnel testing. The kind of testing we would have traditionally done maybe 20, 30 years ago in a wind tunnel, we can now do much more quickly and much more efficiently in a big supercomputer. Um, so this is traditionally what wind tunnels uh, look like. Uh, there are some big problems with wind tunnels for the kind of thing that I'm doing. Um, the biggest problem, really, is that there simply are no supersonic wind tunnels where you can roll the ground underneath the car. Okay? Um, there are complex wind tunnels that the Formula One teams use, where they have a conveyor belt and they can rotate the wheels of the car, which is important in terms of the aerodynamic behavior of the car. Um, they sim there are simply no supersonic conveyor belts that you can pop into a wind tunnel and simulate that kind of thing. 
The second problem with them is they're incredibly expensive. Um, to, to hire them and to use them is expensive. Every time you want to change the design that you're studying, you have to physically change the model that you put into the wind tunnel. To some extent, that problem is being overcome today with rapid prototyping. So 3D printing helps us much more quickly um, change the designs we put into wind tunnels. But they're still much more expensive and more time consuming than doing the virtual equivalent of that, which is CFD or computer modeling. Um, and computer modeling is one of the areas that really we are very proud that we have uh, real strengths in at Swansea. Um, this chap here, Professor Oleg Zinkevich, um, if you've ever got a, t a, a textbook of the finite element method or finite differences, finite volumes, almost certainly this chap here will get a reference. Um, back in the 1960s and 1970s, he was really one of the pioneers who started taking uh, the field of numerical methods and applying it to real engineering problems. Um, and still, when I travel around and I mention that I'm from Swansea, people will, will say, oh, that's where Alex Zinkevich is from, the grandfather of the finite element method. Um, and we've got to the point in terms of computer simulation today, and certainly where we're at and the research group I work with in Swansea, where we would say, you give us a physical problem. As long as we can get our head around the physics of the problem, we'll have a go at simulating it for you. Um, we can't guarantee we're going to give you the right numbers, but there aren't many physical problems where you can get grasp the physics of the problem where, you, where we wouldn't say we could have a go at solving that problem for you using computer simulation. Um, and the very specific task of aerodynamic simulation we refer to as CFD. Um, so the process that I go through whenever I'm looking at a, a stage in the design of Bloodhound is to start off with a specification of the geometry that I'm studying, and typically that will be in the form of CAD file. Um, so I work very closely with another group of engineers who are based in Bristol, who are developing structural design and the material design for the car. Um, and they will pass me uh, geometries in, the terms, in terms of a CAD file, which then I have to convert into what's known as a computational mesh. Just out of interest, how many people here have got experience in numerical modeling or CFD? A few of you. Okay. So I'm going to brush over some of these things very quickly, but if there's specific areas of interest that you want to chat to me about, maybe we'll create some time at the end for that. So I create a mesh, and this is essentially a discretization of the space around the car that I'm studying so that a, that a computer can handle it. Do you use something like console? Or? We use our own uh, software that we've developed. Um, so the system that we use for this is called the Flight 3D system. It's not a commercial package, although we've made it available to industry in the UK. So it, this software that I use here it was also used to design the Airbus A380. All the aerodynamic design for that was done using this system. Um, and basically, I mean, the papers that were written on this software system as it was developed through the 80s and 90s are what were used to develop things like Fluent, um, so some of the commercial packages that are, are available today. So it's the same. The essence of it is the same. Um, we then do the expensive bit, which is running the CFD solver. So typically, I'll run on um, a big parallel supercomputer. Usually, simulations I'll run on 128 processors, and they'll take a steady state simulation will typically take about 24 hours to run. Again, if that's the side of things you're interested in, maybe we can have a chat a little bit more about those specifics later. And at the end of this whole process, we get data, okay? We get information that tells us what the predicted pressure distribution over the car is going to be. From that, we can work out what lift coefficient and drag coefficient of the vehicle are going to be at various speeds. And we can also create the things that we all love as scientists, which is pretty pictures. Um, I always put these up because some people go, wow, I love this, and some people go, ah. Um, I first came across these equations when I was 18 years old. Uh, I, I did an undergraduate degree at Cambridge University uh, in the UK, um, and then Swansea drew me in to do a PhD. Um, and I feel like they've haunted me ever since I met them. Um, how many of you have come across the Navier-Stokes equations before? A few of you. A little bit, OK? Um, if you look at that and you think that is absolutely horrendous, that is, a, that is horrible, you're absolutely right, OK? Um, there's actually a mathematics institute in America right now offering a $1 million prize to anybody who can come up with a unique solution to these equations in the general case. Okay? At the moment, there's only an analytic solution for these, for the, the most simple of geometries. Um, so, so they've haunted me. Um, and instead of solving them exactly, getting exact solutions to them, what you're doing in the world of numerical modeling is finding approximate solutions. That's what numerical modeling essentially is all about. And although mathematically they look horrendous, they're actually derived from three very, very simple principles. And this is something I keep trying to drum home to our students when they encounter these. And they get very scared because the maths looks horrible. 
But actually, the principles that they're based on are based on the kind of principles we learn in school. The principle of conservation of mass, the principle of conservation of momentum, and the principle of conservation of energy. And when you start expressing those in the context of aerodynamics, mathematically, things get complicated. But essentially, what we're doing in CFD is solving these equations using a big computer. Um, when I talk about these meshes that we use, this is just a slice through one of the meshes that I would use to run a simulation. Um, right down at the bottom here, this red dot is the car. This gives an idea of the space around the car in which we're solving those equations. So that's the space in which I'm trying to understand what the flow, what the car is doing to the flow field around it. And as I mentioned, at the end of all of this, we get the thing that scientists always love, I think, which is lovely, beautiful images. Okay? Um, and when we stitch these images together, we can get an idea of how the flow field over the car varies with the speed that the car is traveling at. Um, what I'm showing you here is a computer simulation from quite a few years ago now, um, in the early stages of the design of the car. And I'm plotting pressure. Typically, aerodynamics get obsessed with pressure. Okay? We want to know where high pressure regions are going to be on the car, where low pressure regions are going to be, because those translate into forces. Um, in this coloring here, the purple are the high pressures. And then you go through purples, blues, greens, oranges, and reds, and then low pressure. Okay? So at the moment, we're at Mach 0.8. So 0.8 times the speed of sound, which works out at about just over 600 miles per hour. Um, so you can see that at the nose of the car, you've got purple. So as the nose is compressing the air ahead of it, you're getting high pressure. At the back of the car, as the air expands, you're getting red, which is low pressure. And just watch happens as we accelerate the car. So we've now gone through Mach 1, which is the speed of sound. So the car's now traveling at supersonic speeds. So on the left-hand side, what you've got is the, the underneath of the car. Okay? Um, that's very important from, from a lift point of view. We're trying to minimize the amount of high pressure that, that, can, that can exist underneath the car. And on the right-hand side is, the, is actually the desert surface that the car is running across. Okay. Um, the scales are a little bit different. So on the right-hand side, we're zoomed out. So you can just about make out, I think, two black dots towards the top and two black dots halfway down, which are the front and rear wheels of the car, where they intersect with the, the ground. And hopefully what you can see, if I let me run this again, is that as we approach Mach 1, so around about now, we start generating these features which are most clearly seen on the desert surface, where you have these sudden transitions from the greeny colors to the purple colors. So what are those? Shockwaves. Those are shockwaves. Okay? So, 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 you've got, so what you suddenly see as we transition into the supersonic regime is rather than the flow pattern being nice and smooth, you have these very sudden transitions in color. You go from the green, which are kind of ambient pressures, through to the purples, which are very high pressure. And that sudden compression of the air um, are shockwaves. And trying to understand where these shockwaves are going to sit, how they're going to wrap around the car as it accelerates, which parts of the car's geometry they're going to interact with, allows us to understand how they're going to influence the car's behavior. Um, now, if you don't come from the world of computer simulation, um, you could quite easily at this point, where I tell you we can solve all the world's problems by simulating things. Okay? Forget about physical modeling. We all need to go into the world of virtual modeling, okay? um, which often you hear when you go to kind of computer modeling conferences. People say, oh, you know, why do people bother doing experiments anymore? You know, we, we can do everything with computers these days. And you would be right to ask the question, well, how on earth do you know, if that's what you think, that the numbers you get out of that computer are correct? If, if all you've done, and this is what we've done, all we've done to design Bloodhound is run computer simulations. There's been no wind tunnel testing. There's been no rocket sled testing. We won't know if we've got it right until we actually test the car. The entire Airbus A380 was designed from concept to final design using CFD. No wind tunnel testing whatsoever. And you could quite rightly say, well, how on earth can you be confident that the CFD, is, this is just ones and zeros flying around inside the computer, giving you predictions, how do you know they're correct? Well, of course, what we have to do is validate our computer simulations. This is very important. Okay? Um, and in fact, nowadays, that's what wind tunnels are being increasingly used for, is to validate uh, new computer models. Um, this is a very famous test that we conducted back in the late 1990s. Um, I was only a teenager at the time. So when I say we, I'm talking about my colleagues at Swansea. Um, this is a, a one-tenth scale model of the current land speed record car thrust SSC. So it's about this long. Um, and as you'll see in just a minute, we strapped a whole series of rockets to the back of this car. And it was fired down a test track, which is just down the road from us um, at the university. Um, 
This, this model accelerates from zero to 800 miles per hour in 0.8 seconds, which, as you'll see in a minute, is astonishing. And the model was wired up with a series of pressure sensors, which were measuring the pressure at different points on the car at different speeds. And the experiment was repeated with the car at slightly different angles of attack. Um, so let me just show you a movie of what this experiment looked like. Is it possible to turn the volume just up a, a little bit? So it's pretty impressive, yeah? On that day, I think as long as, along with doing some serious scientific work, they also had a lot of fun. Um, oh, for the record, uh, is it okay to have the track? Yeah, absolutely. It's fitted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, anything. Is it from launching from, from... Oh, oh, no, so in terms of, okay, in terms of the land speed record? Yeah. No, so for, so for the actual land speed record, you can't have a track, okay? okay? You, you have to be, it just you have four wheels. And, and just rolling on those four wheels. This testing, which was just for validating the CFD, yes, we pinned the car down onto the track so it couldn't take off. Okay? Um, and of course, data was taken from the actual real world experiment, the real physical world we live in. Um, and my colleagues at Swansea were asked, okay, so if you believe so strongly in this CFD method of yours, you should be able to predict the results we got. Okay? And they were asked to do a series of computer simulations to try and predict the results that came from this without seeing the data. And the two sets of data were compared um, and if you speak to anybody who's involved in the Thrust SSC project, they will tell you that this document here is by far the most important document in the, the entire story of the Thrust SSC project. Um, what I'm showing you here, on the x-axis are data from the, the Pendine test, the actual rocket test. Um, and these are they basically did various pressure readings in PSI. And on the y-axis um, are the, C, the equivalent CFD results. So each of those points represents a pressure reading at a specific point on the car at a specific speed with the car at a particular uh, angle relative to the flow. And you can see that the vast majority of the points actually did sit on the line you would hope they would sit on if you're comparing data in this way, a y equals x line. Okay? Um, in fact, even the team in Swansea were impressed with the level of consistency they got in these results. The majority of the points that they predicted were within just a few percent of the real world data. Now, of course, those of you who are scientists or engineers will quickly say to me, ah, what about these ones down here? Okay, I can, I can, I can see your eyes. You, you don't care about the ones that fit the, line, the, the, the trend. You care about the data points that don't. Now, when I was in school and we had data like this that we had to analyze and we, used to, we were taught how to draw a line of best fit, all we were taught to do in school when we had points like this was just put a red circle around them and label them as anomalous results and move on to the next question. <laughs> Now, in the real world of engineering, it's nice to know. If you're going to go and put a human being inside somebody designed based on this data, um, it's nice to know why you get anomalous results. I think it's an important question that engineers and scientists ask themselves. Um, so given that footage that I just showed you, um, and from what little you know, perhaps, of computer simulation, does anybody want to have a guess at why there are what, one, two, three, four data points where clearly the computer simulation wasn't doing a very good job of replicating reality. Any ideas? It's, it's not necessarily to do with the approximation that was used. I mean, it wasn't to do with the malfunction in the sensor. That was probably the first thing they explored, was were their sensors malfunctioning? In fact, today, if you, if you saw a data set like this, where you're computer, comparing computer simulation with real world, Today, the first thing you would assume is there's probably a problem with the way we measured the real world situation. You would, you would assume that what's correct is the computer simulation. In the mid-1990s, probably they first assumed that it was the computer simulation that was getting it wrong. Um, what, 
was so impressive about the video I showed you? I, mean, I, saw, I was watching your faces, and most people went, ooh, you know, as, as, as the rocket fired. What was so impressive about that? The acceleration, absolutely. It wasn't necessarily the speed. OK, the speed is impressive. What I think is most impressive about the video is the fact that you've got a model sat stationary, and in less than a second, it's then traveling faster than the speed of sound. It's the acceleration that's impressive. And of course, that acceleration was just so that we could get that model up to the speed we wanted it on the track that we had available to run on. Okay? That kind of acceleration isn't what happens in reality. In reality, we accelerate relatively slowly to our peak speed. And the computer simulation wasn't taking account for the fact that there were these extreme accelerations being experienced by the model. And in fact, what they managed to show analytically is that that acceleration, and equally the deceleration after it had reached its peak speed, was actually affecting the position that some of the shot crew sitting on the car were sat at. And all of those data points were point positions on the car very close to the position where a shot wave was sitting. And what the acceleration or deceleration in the physical world test was doing was pushing the shock wave to one side or the other of that sensor, which wasn't being predicted in the CFD simulation. So even, even you know, 20 odd years ago, back in the mid 1990s, in the early days of CFD, um, it was the computer simulation actually that was getting things it was a better representation of what the real world was like than a, than a physical test. Um, now, one of the things, I mean, as I mentioned, we're, we're doing this project for is to promote British engineering around the world. Um, one of the concerns we have in the UK right now about the state of engineering, and I have no idea what it's like in Brazil, and it'd be interesting to find out, actually. Um, engineering isn't perceived in the UK these days as being particularly glamorous. Okay? It doesn't have a particularly high... Uh, profile, like, you know, along with, with doctors, and lawyers, and um, so what we're trying to do is encourage more young people because we need engineers. We desperately need engineers. Um, so we're trying to encourage more young people to take up engineering at university, and we're using this project to do it. Because in the past, if you speak to lots of British engineers who are working in industry today, they will, particularly in the field that I come from, in aerospace, they'll talk to you about things like Concorde and Spitfire, a generation before that inspired them to become engineers. They looked at these incredible, iconic designs. I, I want to do that. And there's a concern in the UK today that we don't have enough of these iconic engineering projects that are inspiring young people today to be engineers in 20 years' time. So that's one of the kind of rationale for doing this, which means I get to travel into schools. And I do this exercise wherever I go, whether I'm speaking at universities, with school children. Uh, I've got this picture. Um, this is quite an old design of the car from um, early in the design process. Um, and let's imagine that this is now traveling across the desert in South Africa where we're going to run the car at 1,000 miles per hour, um, what are some of the forces going to be that it will be acting on this car? Drag. drag. Okay, so uh, in aerodynamics, we know it generates a drag force. If you've ever ridden a bicycle at high speed, it's good to duck down low because that minimizes the drag. So there's a drag force. There's also in the... Uh, for, there's lift, okay? So if you've been on an airplane, we know that if there's an aerodynamic flow, there's a vertical force that the, the air can generate. Now, we're hoping that our lift force will be, have a negative value, a small negative value, because we don't want it to take off. Equally, okay, unlike Formula One cars, where basically they try to get as much downforce as they possibly can, we could easily at these speeds generate far too much downforce and just drive the whole car down into the soft surface that we're running on, and we have the world's fastest plow, not the world's fastest car. Um, so we've got lift and we've got drag. Friction. friction. So I'll lump that together in the drag force. Okay, so we've got friction within the wheel system and between the wheels and the ground. Lump all, lump all that together in drag. So we've got lift and drag. Gravity. Okay, so the car's got mass, just we have mass, so gravity is acting on the mass, trying to pull the car down. So we've got lift, drag, gravity. At the moment, in your concept for your vehicle, you've got nothing to drive the car forward. OK, so we've, got, so we've got a reaction force, or, or typically we call it, in aerospace, we call that force a thrust force. Okay? So we've got the jet engine and the rocket engine on board driving the car forward. So we've got a thrust force. And there's one last force that we're missing. And what's really interesting is, and I think if you, if you teach, certainly if you teach kind of mechanics, you'll be like, yeah, do you know what? This is what my students would miss too. No, no matter where I do this exercise, okay, whether it be with little kids, with university professors, it's always this fifth force that people forget about. And the irony is, it's a force that's acting on all of us right now. What was the Well, because that's kind of all lumped together in the drag and the, the lift. So, so gravity is acting on the car, and gravity is acting on us. 
And what gravity is trying to do is accelerate us down towards the center of the Earth. But fortunately, we're, fortunately, we're not accelerating down towards the center of the Earth because something's stopping that from happening. Yeah, there's, there's a, like a normal force or a reaction force that's, 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 that's acting up. On my, in the case of me, it's acting on my feet, pushing me up. And after you've been standing too long, your feet hurt because there's been a force pushing up from the floor. In your case, it's acting through your seat on you. Okay? So there are these reaction forces. And people always forget about this force and, and trying to understand how that reaction force behaves is, is important in, di in, ter in terms of understanding the, the dynamics of the vehicle. Of course, in the case of the car, the reaction force is acting at the wheels, the four points in which the car uh, makes contact with the ground. But of course, all of these forces here um, can be predicted in advance. Okay? The aerodynamics can be used, uh, the, the computer modeling can be used to predict the lift and the drag forces. We have data from the engine manufacturers that will give us predictions of the thrust forces. We know what the weight of the car should be as it runs. And we can then from those look at the reaction forces. And if you can predict this force system in advance, then you can predict the, the response of the car, the behavior of the car. And what I'm going to show you at the end um, is what our prediction of what a 1,000 mile per hour run of the car um, will look like. Just very quickly, I'm going to talk about, um, if this will run, yeah. I'm just going to talk about the two engines, the two dominant engines we've got inside this. We've uh, stolen a jet engine from the Ministry of Defense. We haven't stolen. We, we asked for it. We uh, said, could we, have, could we have an EJ-200 jet engine from the Eurofighter Typhoon? This is probably one of the most advanced military jet engines available today. It's, there are two of them in the Eurofighter Typhoon, um, and we've got one of them for Bloodhound. Um, with the afterburners burning, this generates nine tons, or nine kilonewtons of thrust. Okay? Um, and most people are, these days are fairly familiar with how a jet engine works. Okay? So it sucks in cool air at the front, which gets compressed through a fan and a compressor. That compression increases its pressure and temperature. You then add the fuel in the combustion chamber. Um, this causes pressures and temperatures to go even higher. And you've got all these hot exhaust gases and they need to expand somewhere. So they expand through a turbine at the back. The turbine is connected to the compressor at the front with a shaft that runs down the middle of the engine. And then all of these gases expand at the back. Newton's third law of action kicks in and pushes the whole thing forward. Okay? Again, that's kind of like a two-minute version of a master module that we teach okay? um, in, in jet engine design. What we tend to be less familiar with um, are how rocket engines work. Now, nine tons of thrust isn't enough for us. We calculated that just off the jet engine, we could probably get the Bloodhound car to somewhere in the region of 800 miles an hour. Because drag is scaling with velocity squared, the step from 800 to 1,000 miles an hour requires an awful lot more thrust. So we've designed the largest rocket engine that the UK has ever created, specifically for the car. It's a hybrid engine, which means it uses a liquid oxidizer, which is hydrogen peroxide. Any chemists here? Does anybody know what the... Okay, so the chemical symbol for hydrogen peroxide is... Testing it now. <laughs> H2O2. H2O2. So it's, it's water with, with this additional oxygen atom attached to it, which means it's not particularly stable. Okay, we know that oxygen and water are stable, but when you put them together like that, it's not very really stable. And hydrogen peroxide wants to break down into those two substances and releasing energy as it does so. Okay, so we pump, or we will be pumping, a ton of hydrogen peroxide at about 99% concentration into this rocket engine. It passes through the catalyst pack at the front, which is basically a silver-plated uh, nickel catalyst pack. That triggers the breakdown of the hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, generating extremely high temperatures and pressures. That then triggers the burning of the solid fuel, which is inside the rocket. So you've got this com combination of liquid oxidizer decomposition, the burning of the solid fuel, which makes it a hybrid rocket, and then again, just like the jet engine, all of this stuff has to expand somewhere. So it expands through a nozzle at the back, and the third law of uh, motion kicks in and pushes the whole thing forward. So the profile of the burning is there. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting into rocket design, which is not somewhere I plan to go. Um, but yeah, you'll see that the profile of the solid fuel inside here is extremely important. And this is something we've had to spend. Uh, this is not my area of expertise. So this is, I'm basically explaining the limits to where I, how I understand this. Obviously, the surface area that's exposed to the high temperature gases um, from the decomposition of the hydrogen peroxide affects the burning rate and how much energy you're releasing. So, so you try and design a profile that, that makes the surface area exposed the same as it burns back. If it was just a, a cylindrical uh, cross-section there, obviously the surface area would be getting bigger and bigger as it burns. You'd be getting more and more thrust. So you have this star shape internally, which tries to, to maintain the surface area as the thing burns out. That's the idea. But who said that the cost of thrust is high? 
Well, this is a good question. And now you're moving into an area that I don't have expertise in. So I'm going to say, look on the website. <laughs> um, we tested this engine. In fact, we tested a 50% scale version of the engine uh, last year in the Mojave Desert in America. Um, let me just show you what this was like. It will play, yeah. Imagine you're our driver, his name is Andy Green, he's an RAF fighter pilot, strapped to the front of a rocket twice that size, generating 12 tons of thrust. On top of the rocket is a jet engine generating 9 tons of thrust, and you're hurtling along with your bum about that high above the ground. That's what our driver will be experiencing. Um, just in terms of how the car design has evolved, and again, it's predominantly CFD that has driven the external shape evolution of the car. The initial concept, which was back in 2007, uh, Bloodhound is shown in the top left here. And just like we've done with car design, going back to that steam locomotive, the question we ask for each, each iteration of the design of the car is, what are the problems here? Is it generating too much lift at different speeds? And how can we solve that problem and evolve the design of the car to this? And this is what we're now building. And we're about halfway through the build of the car. We're hoping the car will be built by summer 2014, so our summer, middle of next year sometime. Um, this is one of the most recent uh, CFD visualizations that I've done. Again, I'm showing pressure distribution over the car and over the desert surface with some stream ribbons just showing the, the, uh, the path that the air particles take. And some of the work that's going on right now back in Swansea, and some of my students, well, they should be working on this while I'm over here enjoying myself in Brazil, um, they're looking at the aerodynamics uh, of the air brakes because an equally challenging problem for a car like this is, is not just getting it 1,000 miles per hour, it's then getting seven tons of metal and carbon fiber to decelerate again back down to zero. Uh, and we're going to have some air brakes that will open on the side of the car. And at the moment, I've got some students uh, who are working with me on this. In fact, over the summer, our summer just gone, we've had some Brazilian Science Without Borders students with us. Um, and they've been looking at some similar stuff to this. Um, Siemens are involved. They're, gonna, they're doing a lot of the computer systems for us. Yeah. Where did you spot that? There was a previous slide. Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> so that's Impressive. How did you work out the seams were involved in that? <laughs> um, so that's the final artist impression of the car. This is what we're building right now. Um, just to wrap up before I finish, now lots of people say to me, okay, so the land speed record, this is in a straight line. You've just got to go as fast as you can in a straight line. So surely it's easy to drive a car like this. Um, I'm going to show you that that's not the case. This is uh, Andy Green, who's also going to drive our car, driving Thrust SSE back in 1997. This is the run where he broke the land speed record in 1997. On the right, you'll see hands in the cockpit, and on the left is a view from the tail plane of the car. So the initial acceleration is actually quite modest, simply because we can't spool up the jet engine straight away because it will suck in a lot of dust from the desert surface. So until Andy gets the car to above 100 miles per hour, um, he won't throttle the engine all the way forward. In just a moment, you'll see the afterburners on the jet engines light up. And that's when the two spay engines, which is what we had on thrust, are generating their full thrust. You should also be able to see a white line just about. There's a white line that will be drawn on the track, and Andy's trying to keep the nose of the car bang on that straight line, on that white line. So here are the afterburners kicking in now. He's at about 300 miles per hour at this point. 350 miles an hour. We'll get the picture back. where he has a problem.
She's now releasing the parachute to get the car to slow down. I'll stop it there. And you saw at top speed, he's doing about 750 miles an hour with full lock on the steering wheel, trying to keep it back on the, on the white line. It's pretty, uh, that track's just under 10 miles long. Okay. That was in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. Now, we looked at that desert surface to run Bloodhound on. Unfortunately, the quality of the surface has deteriorated over the last 10 years because of climate and some activities that go on on the desert. And we found what we think is a much better place in South Africa, a place called the Hackskeen Pan. So I'm just going to talk you through what we think a run, a 1,000 mile per hour record run of Bloodhound will look like. Uh, the blue line here is acceleration measured in G, so multiples of 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, on the right hand side, and the red line is speed, okay, uh, measured in miles per hour. So to get to convert that to kilometers per hour, it's roughly a multiplication of 1.6, something like that. Yeah. You have to uh, find out if it's a natural spot, or can you actually work on the spot previously? Well, yeah, you, you, yeah, so we have prepared the track, okay, so, so what we've had to do in South Africa to get it ready is literally cover the whole track and picking up stones. The stone impact is something we just don't have a solution for. So the solution is we make sure there are no stones. So we've actually, over a period of two years, had a team of about 50 people in South Africa basically walking up and down picking up stones. In fact, okay, we're going we're gonna to have our name in the Guinness Book of Records before the land speed record as the largest area of the earth hand cleared um, will, be a, will be a record that we're going to go for before we get the land speed record. Um, the initial acceleration, just like on thrust, is relatively modest, just because we can't spool up the jet engine until we get to about 100 miles per hour. Um, that's when Andrew will light the afterburner on the EJ200 jet engine. You can see the thrust jumps up, which means the acceleration jumps up. Um, he's now got sitting on 9 tons of thrust, or 90 kilonewtons of thrust. Once he passes through 300 miles per hour, after about 25 seconds or so, he will then click a button on the control column, which will, will start pumping the hydro hydrogen peroxide into the rocket engine. Um, slowly the thrust of the rocket engine then kicks in until the solid fuel burn, that little wiggle there is, is what happens when the, uh, the solid fuel starts, starts to burn. Initially you get a drop and then it kicks in. Um, by this point now he's sitting on 21 tonnes of thrust, accelerating at about 3G or approaching 3G, which is, his speed will be increasing by about 60 miles per hour every second. He gets to the measured mile where the, we'll have our speed measured over, that, over the mile distance in about 43 seconds, another 1,000 miles per hour, it'll take him three and a half seconds to cross that measured mile. He's now got about four and a half miles to slow down. So he's doing a mile every three and a half seconds, and he's got four and a half miles before there's a mountain at the end of the track. Okay, so we've got to get the car to slow down. So we've got a series of air brakes and parachutes that eventually get the car to slow down. So in the, I guess in the language of mathematics, that's what a run of Bloodhound looks like. And just to finish, I'm going to show you a very short movie that will explain what we think this is going to look like.
So, as easy as that. <laughs> um, I know I've probably spoken for longer than I should have, so I apologize for that. Um, this is where we are. This is uh, Swansea University. The, the College of Engineering is this building here. I love it because it's the closest building to the beach, which is uh, great for me. I'm a surfer, so I love that. Um, obviously, this is, this is the project I work on. It's the thing I get very excited about, as you can probably tell. Um, but it's one of many exciting projects that we've got currently going on within the College of Engineering. So if you want to find out more about what's going on at Swansea and opportunities at Swansea, please do uh, speak to us about that as well. Um, I don't know if we've got enough time for, to answer questions, but I, I'm in no rush. So, uh, <laughs> do you have a YouTube question? There is, yeah, if you go on YouTube and search for Bloodhound SSC, there's lots of interest. There's a lot more movies than the ones I've shown you there. Um, and there's also a fantastic website, which is bloodhoundssc.com. Um, one of the nice things about a land speed record project, other, which is unlike lots of industrial projects, is that because we don't mind, we, we, there are competitors, but all the competitors are using very different designs, very different approaches. We can be completely open and share data and share information about why we've made decisions we've made. Um, so actually, there's an awful lot of technical data available to you at the website. Um, and it's also being it's used for education purposes as well. So if you go to bloodsse.com, can find out all kinds of different things about the project. Thank you very much. I always think about, okay, this car will not be visible for a life yeah. in a yeah. many years yeah. from now. Yeah. But there is a lot of knowledge which you are discovering during this yeah. research. Yeah. And what kind of side effect of this research of yours yeah. are, is practical for us in daily life? Good question, and that's an important question. I, mean, I started by saying that the reason I think it's good to do things like this, just like it was good for NASA to put a man on the moon, not because necessarily we all benefit directly from there having been a man on the moon, but they learned a lot, a lot of technology from that spins out into other things. And we're hoping the same will be the case in this. Um, for the specific area that I'm interested in, in terms of computational modeling, um, some of the things that we've developed specifically for this, I'm now starting to work with other industrial partners on um, applying to more everyday activities. One of the things we developed for this, which I didn't talk about, um, is developing a model for high-speed particle entrainment. So of course, one of the things aerodynamically that's a little bit different about this, and one of the big question marks we have about how it will behave, is that we will be inevitably entraining dust and particles into the flow around the car. Um, so we've developed a specific model of that high-speed particle entrainment that we've used to supplement or kind of add a factor into the drag value in the, uh, that we're predicting for the car. We're now starting to think about, well, what other applications could we apply this high-speed particle entrainment model to? So things like aircraft landing on wet runways, okay, and the spray that, that gets kicked up when that happens affects the, the deceleration distance of the aircraft. Um, high-speed trains, obviously, there's a level of particle entrainment that occurs with high-speed trains, and we're starting to think about, well, how do we apply the model from this in the context of high-speed trains? Um, one of the things that we've, I haven't been involved in this, but the other engineers have been involved in, was the wheel design for the car was a massive headache. Um, these things are rotating. They're about a meter diameter discs, rotating at 10,000 RPM. So the radial forces at the rim of the disc are enormous. In fact, there was a point about three years ago where we thought we were just going to have to stop the project because we simply couldn't design wheels that would hold together at these kind of speeds um, unless we could build them out of pure titanium. And we couldn't find anybody willing to give us that much titanium. Um, Lockheed Martin, the aircraft manufacturer, came on board and they helped us design an aluminium alloy wheel design with a slightly different profile. And some of the techniques that they've developed for that, they're now thinking about in the military context, how they can apply them. Um, so yes, almost certainly. I mean, my, my brain is still so engaged in this at the moment that these are just kind of ideas that I'm throwing at students and saying, oh, you know, this might make an interesting research project. We've developed this. What about the research project thinking about applying it to that? But what I will be doing as soon as this project is over, probably in about two years' time, we hope, if everything goes to plan, is then going, right, this is what we got. This is what we did on Bloodhound. You know, in terms of everyday life now, what can we apply this technology to? And that's important. I, mean, I think that's a, a good justification for doing it. Uh, why did they make Bloodhound? Oh, good question. Um, the, the answer to that is, back in 2007, when I, when I first got involved, and it was a very small team, and we were basically, we had a research year between 2007 and 2008, uh, where we were looking at, just in terms of laws of physics, can this be done? Um, a big part of that was the aerodynamics. We just wanted to know, is it physically possible post-war? Um, never actually fired in the end. Um, but he said, just as a code name, J-1, 
just so that we've got something, you know, a word to you that people won't know what we're talking about. Let's call it Bloodhound after a project that I worked on 50 years ago. Um, and then, of course, when we got to the end of the research year, we all agreed, yes, this can be done. We're going to take this out and we're going to go to the media and publicise it. We needed a name. And we sat down for about half a day to try and think of a, a name for this. And we couldn't think of anything that we thought was better than Bloodhound. And then we added on the SSC at the end, taken from Thrust SSC, which stands for Supersonic Car. It's the Bloodhound supersonic car, which I think now is a stupid name because Bloodhound is not a fast dog. It's a, it's a slow, big dog with big floppy ears. I mean, if it was a Greyhound supersonic car, then I could understand it. But uh, that's the reason it came from a code name. We never intended it originally to be the name of the car. The air brakes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, we, you could. There's, there's nothing in the land speed record rules. One of the nice things about the land speed record, and one of the, and this is one of the reasons why, when you look at all the land speed record cars of history, they all look completely different. Because unlike Formula One, there aren't these strict set of rules that you all have to adhere to. Um, and the rules basically say it must have a driver on board who's in control of the car, whatever that means. Okay, um, it must have a minimum of four wheels, and the steering must be done through the wheels. Okay, those are basically the rules. You can't have a track. Um, uh, an actual uh, track that's pinned to. It has to be kind of free on the surface. Um, so you could create yourself a track. Um, the problem is, I mean, that would be incredibly expensive. We need, we need about 10 miles to run the car, and what we've got in South Africa then is a mile of overrun at either end. It's um, supposed to be better than that. Well, it's, when, I talk, when I talk about a desert, okay, this isn't, you know, like the Sahara sandy desert. This is not, a, this is, it's, like, it's basically a dried out lake bed. So in their, in their wet season, the surface floods, and then when, it, when they, the, the surface dries out in the dry season, it leaves this perfectly flat kind of mud crust, like an alkali plier surface, um, which, it, which it, we think is perfect because you, can, you can't put tyres on these wheels. They, I mean, tyres will just blow themselves apart. So they, they, they have to be solid metal wheels. Or possibly we, we, we were thinking about going on a carbon fibre route when we were starting to really panic about the wheels. But we ended up with an aluminium alloy. So you want some kind of compliance in the surface. You don't want a solid surface to run your solid metal wheels on. And actually what we've got here is very good. Um, yeah, exactly. You, you, the, the surface provides the compliance, not the tyres. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you are going to train yeah. a straight yeah. line, why do you need a turn? Yeah. Well, good question. I mean, you saw Andy in that. I mean, that only was going in a straight line. The reality is, I mean, at these kind of speeds, the sensitivities to gusts of wind, sensitivities to differences in the surface that you're running across. You get a little patch on one side of the car that's slightly soft surface and the wheel digs in a little bit and that takes the car off. So he will constantly, I mean, he's acting basically as a, a human trimmer, just making, bringing the car back on track. Now, one of the things you saw on that was just after the video went on the left-hand side, the car veered off to the left-hand side. Um, they always were unsure about why that happened, and because th that was that was a consistent phenomenon as they're testing the car. At that particular speed, the car would veer off to the left. So it wasn't something to do with the track, um, because it happened every time, no matter which direction they were running in. The thrust car was actually um, asymmetric, so the rear wheels were staggered; they were offset from each other in order to package them into the narrow tail of the car. And what we managed to show through CFD was that at a particular speed, a shockwave system which passed. The, that, that staggered wheel, rear wheel structure caused a moment which could basically flicked out the tail and caused the car to go off track. Of course, in hindsight, if you want a car to behave symmetrically, a symmetric geometry is a, you know, your best starting point, which is what we've got for Bloodhound. So, the, so the, the Bloodhound car is perfectly symmetric, so we don't think we're going to see the level of asymmetric behaviour that Andy experienced driving thrust. But he will still need to compensate for these kind of things you can't control, like gusts of wind and inconsistencies in the surface. Oh, yeah, when you think, I mean, the, 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 I think he had plus or minus two degrees at the wheels. So the wheels, I mean, the turning circle on this thing is like half a kilometre. Um, so even when he's got full lock, the wheel is still only at two degrees. So it's still, I mean, it's still scary to think, you know, as the driver of this thing, you're travelling at 700 miles across the surface with full lock on to try and get you back online. Now, I promised Andy, having studied the aerodynamics of this, that this is going to be an easier car for him to drive. He's hoping that I'm right. <laughs> Well, we haven't tested it, so... Um, oh, but that was a test, right? I mean, 
That movie I just showed you. No, no, this is just, this is just an animation. Oh yeah, so that was that was a different car though. So that was oh, yeah. that was the thrust. That's, that's yeah, so that that car is in the Guinness Book of Records. Is, so that's the that was the thrust SSE car, which is now is still. I mean, that's 1997. Okay. One of the reasons the British are very passionate about this is because the Americans. If you look at the history, it started off in France. The French kind of hang on to it a little bit in the early part of the 20th century. The 1940s onwards, really, it basically went back and forth between the British and the Americans. It just went every every five or ten years. The Brits would take it, the Americans would get it back, the Brits would get it, the Americans would get it back. So between Britain and America, there's this rivalry over the land speed record. The right the Brit now it's right now it's with the British, and it's been with us since the early 1980s. Okay? So, but the Americans are trying to get it back. So they, they, the Americans have two teams at the moment. Uh, one's called the Spirit of America, and one's called the North American Eagle. Um, we don't think either of them have a chance, but that's because we're British. Um, but we, I mean, obviously, one of the things we want to do is make sure that, that, that it stays in Britain. Um, we actually think the best competition out there is an Australian attempt. There's a, there's a car called the Aussie Invader uh, being developed, uh, I think near Melbourne somewhere. Um, and they're at a similar point to us. They've, their design is finished. They're getting the car built. And they've come out publicly and said that they've designed the car to travel at 1,000 miles per hour. And we, we've had a lot of interaction with them, and we think they are a serious contender, which will be great. I think it'll make it all more interesting if there is another team out there. There's also a, a New Zealand team called Jet Black, and we're not sure how serious they are, but uh, yeah. We hope there's be some good competition, because it'll make it exciting. I've been looking at a problem in the information theory that involves um, power, yeah. gain, yeah. and sometimes we can't uh, take a, uh, a simulation of that with pressure, right. temperature. Yeah. Yeah, I can't think of a I, I can't think of a direct analogy, but uh, we should talk about that because that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Oh. The combustion engine. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So you spotted in the movie there's a combustion engine in here as well, which I don't talk, I don't didn't talk about in the talk. Um, and this will give you an idea of how powerful this car is. So, so I mentioned the rocket requires us to pump hydrogen peroxide in. Okay, so we pump one ton of hydrogen peroxide at high pressure into the rocket engine in 17 seconds. In order to do that, we need an 800 horsepower V8 Cosworth racing engine. So we've got basically a Formula One engine, just as our fuel pump. So that gives you an idea. So that's what the, the, the internal combustion engine is for. It's just pumping the hydrogen peroxide. The thrust is, is coming from the rocket and the jet. Christina's leaning forward, which is usually a sign that I've been talking for too long. <laughs> wait, wait, so, uh, I, I don't know the exact data. Perhaps you guys can, can have that. Uh, uh, we had a project developed by our students between mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. Yeah. That won the, uh, the, uh, the race in the United States and Nebraska, right? Uh, yes. For, do you know the date? Uh, it, it's the uh, automotive. Uh, Okay, yeah. It's like a formula car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to create yeah. a formula car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but the category they want is for the electrical car. Right. Because they use a revolutionary engine that someone in Europe discovered okay. in the Holland. Yeah. And I think they want, like, a, they have a, the maximum point that you can have is 1,000. They have a 900. Right, right. So they, they've done well. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. SA formula SA. Yeah. Yeah, we have a similar thing. We call it in the UK, we call it Formula Student. It's, uh, yeah, the students get to design their own race cars and, and test them. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. Did you want to say anything, Christina? If you want some information about the university, just lots of good things you guys can take for yourself. Oh, okay. Nice I called him, but...
say that right. when I saw the thing, so <laughs> I got to stay. Yeah, yeah. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for the hospitality. Yeah, absolutely.